good morning and let me welcome you as we continue to think about intimacy we come now to consider the intimacy of presence I've called it the practice of intimacy presence Jesus in John 14 said those who love me will naturally keep my word and my father will love them and we will come to them and we will make our home with them when you think about it that's quite a remarkable thing to say presence is at first the most natural and inherent need of every human being that is born on planet earth let me say it again but slightly differently at the beginning of every human life presence is the most natural and inbuilt need of every human being from the moment that we were born every one of us knew instinctively and automatically how to express our need for presence from the moment that we entered this world every one of us was born with the inherent ability to effectively make our real need for presence known however through the teenage years many people quickly unlearned that kind of instinctive need for presence and they grew out of it after all being a Christian isn't about my needs is it and what happened then often was that the culture that they grew up in stopped them from growing into seeking the manifest presence of God in their lives this created a vacuum in their Christian lives that was easily and rapidly filled by religious rules and regulations especially concerning God's presence but a distant and remote God was never the way that it was meant to be so I want to introduce you to a newborn baby if you've got children you can think of one of your newborn babies if you haven't picture a newborn baby who by definition is not impressed with this traumatic and life-changing experience called birth now we're going to call this newborn baby Samuel and Samuel is going to teach us about the foundational need for presence that was inbuilt at birth into every single human being to be born on planet Earth but first of all consider that Samuel cannot talk and he hears only a confusion of unintelligible sounds Samuel can barely see and his eyes see only a hazy and unfocused confusion of light and dark Samuel does not understand anything of what he sees and hears and birth is an alien and frightening experience for him Samuel doesn't even understand that he doesn't understand and Samuel cannot think or imagine anything and consider also that Samuel is utterly helpless he cannot feed himself, he cannot clothe himself, he cannot clean himself, and so on. In fact, Samuel does not even know that he needs these things. Indeed, there are a great many things that Samuel does not know, and he does not even know that he does not know them, because Samuel is not yet self-aware. But there is one thing that Samuel does know, and he knows it instinctively presence everything within baby Samuel longs for presence because Samuel needs presence for Samuel presence is made manifest by touch touch is inherent in presence therefore for Samuel presence brings the touch that feeds him presence brings the touch that cleans him presence brings the touch that comforts him now Samuel already knows perfectly well how to get the presence that he wants and the presence that he needs he doesn't have to think about it he doesn't have to meditate on it indeed he cannot do either of these things he does not need to learn how to get the presence that he wants and he needs because the ability to bring the presence that Samuel needs was inbuilt into him before he was born how does Samuel get the presence that he wants and needs? He cries. Samuel's cries may mean that he is hungry. 
Samuel's cries may mean that he is uncomfortable. Samuel's cries may mean that he is dirty. Samuel's cries may mean that he is lonely. Samuel's cries may mean that he is bored. Samuel's cries may mean that he is frightened. Samuel's cries may mean many different things. But Samuel's mother will quickly learn what the different cries means. Means mean. And therefore his mother will respond accordingly when Samuel cries. Now, I want to give you a most important revelation to get hold of. It's this. What Samuel needs is presence, but what Samuel wants is awareness of presence. Samuel may well have presence without him being aware of that presence. For example, his mother can be in the room only a short distance away, but he may not realize that she's there. And when Samuel realizes that he is no longer aware of presence, he cries to gain the awareness of that presence. When Samuel realizes that he is no longer aware of that presence, he panics, because without that presence, Samuel is all alone in an alien and frightening world. Samuel's emotional response to his perceived needs make his very real needs known. Now, Samuel cries not because he doesn't have presence, but because he is not aware of that presence. Samuel's mother's known presence and her touch meet both his needs and his wants. Now, all of you mothers already know all of this. But what about us as adults? God's real presence is given to his people in Christ. That is a fact. I read it already, but let me read you again the words from John's Gospel. When Jesus said, those who love me will naturally keep my word, and my Father will love them, and we will come to them, and we will make a home with them. Jesus pronounced his real presence to all of his disciples down through the centuries and across the whole earth. So, for Christians then, God's presence brings the touch that feeds us. God's presence brings a touch that cleans us. God's presence brings a touch that comforts us, and so on. Within every Christian is the means to get the manifest presence that we want to be aware of. But many of us have repressed and silenced our emotions for many and various reasons. We are Christians, so we don't do emotions in church. Yet, our emotions were designed to be our automatic responses to our realized needs. And the answer to realized need is God's realized presence. As Christians, what we need is presence, and what we have is presence. But, like Samuel, though we most certainly do have that presence, we may not often be aware of that presence. We cry to God sometimes because we are not aware of his presence, and therefore we assume that he is not present with us, when, in fact, he is present with us. And when we are not aware of his presence, we may panic. We may panic because we think that God is not present with us, when in fact he is always present with us. Now, when we panic, God often graciously makes himself known by making us aware of his presence. Our emotions have then achieved their purpose. We became very aware of the presence of God. But what if we have repressed our emotions and buried them deep inside us? Theology is absolutely right to say that God is always with us. Jesus certainly meant what he said when he told us that he would always be present in us and with us as his disciples. But Jesus never ever said that we would always be aware of his presence. And just like Samuel, the issue for us then is not presence, but awareness of that presence. As Christians, we need to relearn how we can be aware of God's presence with us as individuals. 
and how also we can be aware of God's presence with us a group when we are gathered together, whether that's two or three or two or three hundred. We tend to more easily believe that God is only really with us when we are in a large group because the faith level rises as the gathered numbers increase. Our need is to individually learn and practice the awareness of the presence of God. So, how do we do that? Well, awareness of presence comes through invitation and welcome. It really is as simple as that. Long before baby Samuel could think, speak or understand, he knew exactly how to invite presence. He simply made his need known by crying. Samuel's invitation, his crying, is hard to ignore. Samuel's emotional response makes his need known. Samuel expresses his needs instinctively. Long before we were ever able to be mature as Christians, we already knew how to invite and how to welcome God's realised presence with us. But knowing how to do it is very different from actually doing it. So let us just do it. Let us invite and welcome Jesus to make his manifest presence known to us. And as we invite Jesus to do that, we can let go of our inhibitions and put aside our sophisticated attitudes. Now let me give you an example of what welcome isn't and perhaps what welcome is. Many years ago, when I lived in Glasgow, I had a friend who was moving house from Glasgow to Plymouth. And I knew that Plymouth was as far as you could go south without getting your feet wet. On the day that he left and moved house, he said to me, if you're ever passing, just drop in. I laughed and I asked him, who is just passing Plymouth because we'd get our feet wet on the way past. And what he gave me was a, I suppose, the permission to drop in, even though it was never going to happen. But giving somebody permission to drop in on you is not the same as specifically welcoming them to come. It's not the same as giving them a specific invitation and then welcoming them when they take up that invitation. As we saw when we did a series on the Psalms not too long ago at City Gates, the Psalmist can show us how to let go of our inhibitions and put aside our sophisticated attitudes, because our emotions were designed to make us invite God to be with us at a time when we are aware of our real need. But all too often when we are aware of our real need, we run away from God and we run away from one another. All too often when we are aware of our real need, we tend to see God as distant, remote and barely interested. Yet, God longs to make his home real in each of us, not just to live in us, but actually to make his home in us. It is a truth that is so easily taken for granted, or it is a truth that is being taken for granted in the mind but not regarded as being real in life. Let the revelation break upon you even right now that it is God himself who makes his home in you because of Jesus. Those who love me, Jesus said, will naturally keep my word and my father will love them and we will come to them and we will make our home with them. Yahweh, God, who always was, who always is, and who always will be, is making his home in you and I. And the God who created everything in heaven on earth is making his home in you. God who sustains everything by his power is making his home in you. God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit are making their home in you. Paul wrote this to the church at Colossae, for in him, that's Christ, the full, sorry, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have come to fullness in him who is the head of every ruler and authority. And the more like Christ we are, 
the more at home God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit is in each of us. Presence works to change us day by day in order that God may go on making his home in us day by day. And this revelation can radically transform how we relate to God. We will stop seeking the remote God who is out there somewhere and we will grow with God who really is in us. We will stop praying to the remote God who is out there somewhere and we will grow with God who really is in us. If our spiritual lives are routine, if they are mundane, if they are unchanging, it is not words from God that we need, but revelation from God. Revelation that he lives in us and is making his home in us. If you aren't being transformed by revelation from one degree of glory to another, then you probably aren't living God's presence. But God has already given us everything along with Christ, so there is nothing more that he can give to us. So even now, receive what you need from God, who loves you so very much, and be aware of his presence with you now. And receive not just from God, but receive God himself. Let's keep on welcoming him and so keep on receiving what he has for us. God in Christ is with you always and he is for you always. We need to believe that, we need to receive that and we need to live that because that is the foundation of God's presence in us and with us. As I draw to a close, let me say that a change of foundation may be needed because it is possible that for most or all of our Christian lives we have regarded God as being somewhere in heaven, up there, out of the way, kind of remote, kind of distant, and we have to pray extra hard to get him interested in the things that concern us in life. And that is often the foundation that Christians have built their relationship with God on. They have to pray extra good, they have to perform extra good, they have to speak extra good if God is going to be interested in them. But I tell you that's a wrong foundation. The foundation is that Christ in you is the hope of glory and that in you God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit are very much in the business of making their home in you. Why don't you take just a few seconds to allow that revelation to break on you before we move on.